Welcome back, everyone. Over to you, Amy. Friends, thank you all so much for being with us today. And hello, Online Ed 2022. We are thrilled to join you from North Carolina and Texas in the United States. I'm Amy Price, and I'm joined by the amazing Jen. And we'll give you a little bit about our backgrounds and our passions in a second, but we join you from IntelliBoard, your premier data solution. Our biggest goal is to help you improve your learning outcomes with all the data that surrounds you. So like I said, I'm Amy Price. I came to IntelliBoard about five years ago and before that was in higher ed, uh, deep in the throes of first year students, working with them for about 10 years, doing academic support, care team support, worked with institutional effectiveness, worked with our accreditation teams, worked on improving retention rates, the whole kit and caboodle, and I, Loved it and still am super passionate about it. So much so that May is my favorite time of the year because it's when those first year students graduate as seniors and go on into the world. And so a humble thanks for the work that you do. And um, again, thrilled to be with you. Jen, I'll pass it to you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jennifer Ramos. And like Amy said, it's May. Um, that's also an exciting time for me and for for schools, which you all know. We know you are busy celebrating um, your accomplishments throughout the year and preparing for next term. Um, I know this feeling well. I come from to IntelliBoard from an education background. I have 15 years experience um, in education from K-12 to college. I was a teacher, a department chair, K-12 curriculum designer, professor, an academic dean. So uh, my experience as an educator and an academic leadership has led me to truly understand what drives students forward. Um, now that didn't just come with guessing, that didn't just come with understanding that I had to create vibrant lessons, um, and it didn't just come from checking my students' grades, um, nor did it come from just observing other teachers. While all of these things are indeed important, a part, big part of the big picture, the understanding of improving student retention and persistence came with real hard data from a variety of sources. And that's why I came to IntelliBoard. During the pandemic, I was a private tutor and consultant for school districts of North Texas. Oh my gosh, friends, I was also a parent. And I must say hats off to all of you that had to juggle teaching your own kids, your own kids during that challenging time. Um, that was um, pretty intense, I know, for me. So today, we are going to present to you the latest research to come out with college students from whom the pandemic most affected. Things sure have changed. But before we get fully started, uh, please drop your name, your institution, um, and the type of institution that you work for so that we can cater our comments to you, our audience. Um, and if you drop your email, we'll even send you our presentation. And uh, let's see, don't hesitate to ask questions in there. We will do our best to answer. Um, and uh, we look forward to getting to know our audience. So Absolutely. Amy, shall we get started with preliminary research? Yes, let's do it. Friends, it is a brave new world. According to a study by the Faculty of Public Administration at the University of Jubilina, published in October of 2020, 1.5 billion students, billion with a B, from 194 countries shifted to online learning in April of 2020. We all likely still want to put our heads in the sand about how big of an impact, how swift that change was internationally, regionally, even in our own communities and institutions. But we have a responsibility to remember the impacts and what that means for our students and our educational professional selves two years later. If we look at where we started pre-pandemic, which we must, right? We must know where we were and then what we added to. What did we already know about online learning? Bawa's work in 2016, again, pre-pandemic, suggests that students in courses have a 10 to 20% lower retention rate than those who take traditional seated courses. Some trends note that between 40 and 80% of students drop at least one of their online courses. And we know this varies from institution type to institution type, but the distance barrier, right, in that distance learning, in that online learning between the actual classroom and the student cannot be ignored. 
Again, if we jump to the next slide, we see here that the pre-pandemic research, again, work from Sun Wu and Lee, Lou noted the necessary components of successful online learning. It's about design, it's about the material, but most importantly, it's about that faculty member's presence and especially the engagement with the students. That relationship between the faculty member and the student and the opportunity for the peer-to-peer -peer touches in an online environment increases engagement and cannot be ignored. But then we have significant changes, pandemic changes. And we're still seeing the research come out on both of this with both enrollment and retention, but it pushed those trends way faster, higher. Jen will share more about this in a minute, but let's look at the academic and social challenges that we added on during the pandemic. What did happen? Samplings from over 30,000 students from 62 countries, the research supports what we felt firsthand. The impact of COVID was twofold, academic and social and emotional. High concerns included access to technology. At the minimum, some of us were trying to find internet resources for our students. Some of us were already trying to find resource, internet resources for our students in developing areas pre-pandemic. Okay, so check, now you know they have the internet, but do they have the bandwidth? More importantly, not the technology bandwidth, but the bandwidth of the students' perception of their own technology. Can they do it? Can I do this? What about their own self-motivation to persist through challenge, their resiliency? More pressing the readiness of both faculty and technology systems to accommodate for such expansial growth. Equal to academic need, institutions were also concerned with the mental health of faculty, staff, and students. And we know that student space, especially those students who are in lower socioeconomic statuses or special historically underrepresented communities, that there are other challenges. One of my favorite lines from a community college system that IntelliBoard is so honored to work with here in the United States so, so shared that we're all living through this global pandemic, but we cannot forget that students are often experiencing their own personal pandemics and challenges. Be it supporting elders, childcare, access to transportation, the list goes on. I'd be remiss to say that while the pandemic didn't force us into a collective mindset of care, there still and will always be physical and psychological impacts that impact our students' ability to persist and complete. We'll jump into the next slide. We'll see this outlined by number. Published in Inside Higher Education, an early pandemic survey of 172 leaders found that the mental health of students topped the president's short-term concern, cited by 92% of presidents. The mental health of employees followed next at 88%. Beyond the immediate health, social, and emotional factors, we shifted back towards technology readiness. Ugh. Three quarters of campus leaders expressed concerns about, again, that access to technology tools. And I dare say we started going everywhere, right? Make it work. Use the tools that you have, right? We got a little flexible, a little flexible with what we were using. They were less worried, 56%, about their institution's technology readiness to deliver the remote learning, which speaks to the great care and trust of faculty. But as an educator, we know that wasn't easy. If we could give you all the hours to prep back for those courses, we would. And to no one's surprise, the greatest concern at 81% was keeping students engaged through their remote learner. An engaged student persists. An engaged student graduates. There's so much during the pandemic that we couldn't and per still can't control. But as, as educators, we can and should focus on what we can do to keep students engaged engaged in their coursework against a pandemic, no easy feat. No easy feat on a day-to-day -day too. As educators, we should ask for help. We should leverage technology and tools for good that have the biggest impact. Again, giving you back the time to create and deliver the teaching and care for our students. So we know the challenges that we face um, and still face, but Jen, what did all of this do to retention and persistence? Okay, thanks, Amy. Well, 
Not surprisingly, the changes in retention and persistence were quite disappointing. Um, let's take a look at this graph um, published by the College Board. Um, everyone, the data that you see here, it, it is United States data, but we are seeing these decreases globally, which is why we're presenting this to you today. This affects everybody. Um, so first of all, let's define here that student retention is considered re-enrollment in that same post-secondary institution, while we define student persistence as re-enrollment in any post-secondary institution. So according to the College Board's findings, here's what we've got. Enrollment either decreased or was delayed, shrinking cohort class sizes. So this affects our bottom lines as colleges and institutions. It is more cost effective for an institution to see students to degree completion rather than replace them with new students. We know that student retention is a marker of our own student institution success for our accreditation purposes. But more than that, everyone, it's the output of those students into the world, into society, and the impact that their education has on their lives and the collective good of the community that truly matters. The short-term impacts of COVID-19 at our institutions will, no doubt, lead to long-term societal changes. Research by Woodeven and Atwell in 2021 shows that delayed college enrollment or failure to persist after their first year negatively impacts college completion and diminishes lifetime earnings. Retention impacts were uh, seen especially with at-risk populations, and I know this doesn't come as a surprise to all of us. Take a look at this graph. It illustrates that compared to the 2018 cohort, first year persistence rates among students in the 2019 cohort were stable in the public four-year sector, declined by 1.7% in the private non for a nonprofit four-year sector and declined by 5.2% in the public two-year sector. So let's take a closer look at the at-risk population here. Here we can clearly see the significant drop across the board. Look at these orange bars, folks. The declines in two-year college enrollment rates were larger among the underrepresented minority students between 14.6% and 15.5% than non-URM students, which is about 8%. The declines in four-year college enrollments rates were largest among <clears throat> white students, 4.5%, uh, followed by American Indian, Alaska Native students, and then following Asian students at 3.5%. This large drop in re-enrollment has drastic consequences in funding for our institutions. Perhaps even potentially worse is the significant drop in student persistence. Those students did not re-enroll in any post-secondary institution. Let's let that sink in. Those students were on their way to become professionals, uh, lawyers, doctors, teachers, business uh, professionals, scientists. They had to shift. They had to find jobs. They had to stay at home with their kids. Uh, declining health was an issue um, that they had to deal with as well of their own or of their loved ones. Whatever it may be, as a society, we have just lost future educational professionals. This will no doubt have a profound impact on our communities for decades to come. So these findings, I wanna uh, draw your attention here. These findings importantly call for public and higher education authorities to closely collaborate together with other stakeholders and urgently pay attention to vulnerable student groups while seeking to resolve the diverse, most negatively consequences of the prolonged COVID-19 measures around the world. I ask you to think about your institutions now. What part is your school or college doing to resolve these negative consequences? Is there a focused, concentrated effort to intervene with racial ethnic groups among your campus? How about by location, address, or neighborhood? The socioeconomically challenged? One group that particularly decreased in retention and persistence were the students who were first-generation college attendees. Since the pandemic, that particular group, which society has spent decades pushing for post-secondary success, dropped the most at 7.8%. Friends, these are doomsday numbers. We don't even know the full effects or damage of COVID-19 in colleges yet, but this preliminary research shows one sure thing. It's our responsibility as academics to focus on retaining students, the ones that we have, so that we can ensure our society's future success. And here's how we do it. We retain students by increasing mastery of learning outcomes, which leads to successful course completion, 
re-enrollment and graduation. All right, Amy, you ready to tell them how we do it over here? Absolutely, because it, 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 we are in a, in a tough spot, but we can and should and can do it. And you're completely correct on retaining students, which is absolutely a learning outcome, which I dare say is bound to accreditation budgets and again, an overall commitment to society. But this is what we do. At our hearts and minds, we're educators. We have the great opportunity to work at Intel Board where we strive to be your complete data and your complete data solution to put your data into action. Intel Board is a dynamic point and click analytics solution. Imagine designing dashboards for action, getting the right hands of right data into the right hands of people. We want to improve your learning outcomes, your data, and all of its different sources, your SIS data, your LMS data, your ed tech tool data, to simplify processes, solve problems, and promote actions to help your students persist and make an impact on the world. And friends, a shameless plug, perhaps you're keen to learn more, jump over to our blog, blog.intelliboard.net to read our latest Beyond Dropout versus Graduate for a deeper conversation about how your definition of retention changes particular to your institution. But back to Intelliboard as a data-driven solution with the goal of improving learning outcomes, especially retention. Friends, retention takes all of us plus data. It's going to look different at each, each of our institutions. And because that's because the students at each of these institutions are different. And we know that the research hasn't fully caught up with COVID, but we know that this needs to be a data-driven effort. We know that this needs to be identified at the campus level, again, bringing the data together from various different sources. We know that that data needs to identify these at-risk students right, whatever they may be, and they'll be different from campus to campus. And if we really challenge ourselves, we should get ahead of that risk. We should know who our most vulnerable students are academically, demographically. We can then commit to taking action with those students holistically, through advising, through proactive communication, through course design, through uh, frameworks. We're intervening to make an impact. And we need the resources, tools, and technology to make our lives easier, to save time and be our backups. We're still human after all. And that brings us back to monitoring those at-risk students and noting where we have improvement because after all, I dare say us educators strive to be the best learners and we get to do it all over again. I think one more. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So sorry about that. I was just uh, making sure we had everything ready. So like Amy said, but how are we going to bring all of this data together? Um, well, how we do it over at IntelliBoard is with our platform, IntelliBoard Next. We are going to predict student learning behavior. We're going to intervene as soon as possible, and we're going to empower educators with fast data so they can focus on what they do best, teach their subject matter. So step one, we have to identify these students. And often it's the hardest part. There's often external and internal factors, academic and social, ones that students bring to campus, ones that appear on campus. We also have our own personal preferences and groups that we advocate for, but it needs to be data-driven. According to the College Board, the pandemic most adversely affected the college trajectories of first generation underrepresented minority and lower achieving students. We saw that with what Jen shared. Paired that with the knowledge that online programs have that lower retention rate. Sometimes a 20% gap between students who are in full online programs and a seated class. That shifts a little bit at a four year to about a 15% different, but not that much. And again, this was Jane's study in 2016. This is why it's so important to have a grasp on your data. Where do you land in those metrics? Do we know? As a faculty member, do I know my retention rates difference between online programs and seated courses? Where do I need, what questions do I need to ask? And we need to identify who is at risk of how to automate and take action on that data. In the IntelliBoard platform, we give you the ability to create your own predictive learning models. We give you the template. 
then your data informs that model. The things that you need in a, in a predictive learning analytic model is a definition of success. But this needs to be your data, your historical data with the metrics that are most important to you and most proven to you. Then you need to have a historical data of success and non-success. And three, the same data, apply that data to your current examples to see if they're more like the successful student or the non-successful student. But what does that application truly mean? It means that we need to flag students in particular courses if their behavior mimics past non-successful students. Your data is identifying who is at risk proactively. You don't have to wait on the reactive intervention that may be too late. And we've all been there. A student has, hasn't been to my class in two weeks. Oops, I usually catch that, but I'm human. I can see if a student is falling behind and now at risk because they haven't accessed their courses. Now that's done automatically. Think bigger picture. You can have multiple models running at once for different programs, for different years of students. You're not locked into one black box model, nor do you have to create the statistical model. We've created that for you. Just insert your data. The most common user story for predictive learning analytics is identifying these at-risk students. But you can also use predictive learning models to analyze course design, teacher behavior, program curricula, and more. But back to retention, Jen, how do we intervene? Gosh, predictive analytics. That I, if I would have had that as a faculty member, I mean, who knows what we could have done. It's really exciting. So our next step is we intervene. We intervene early with personalized communication that is automated and authentic. Research suggests that teaching presence is a critical factor related to course satisfaction. Um, at IntelliBoard, we use a tool called In Contact that is the hub. It brings together all that student, coach, financial aid um, communication together. We track that communication and behavior data in an easy to use design that ensures top-notch record keeping. Our platform is highly customizable, as Amy said, so anything you need to track, literally anything, can be done in contact. At the schools we have the pleasure to work with, instructors and advisors, department heads, counselors, coaches, all use in contact for consistent early intervention. Academia is rigorous, there is no doubt about that. Our tool, in contact, allows higher ed students, institutions, to ensure that every student is seen, heard, and if needed, intervened upon. Another great feature we have to intervene early is what we call a notification creator in in contact. Imagine creating emails and texts that are personalized to you and your student institution with tracked information that can be sent automatically if a student has shown up for classes or performs below a certain standard, whatever you decide. Um, and most importantly, even though it's automated, it will be personal. You add that personal touch. This frees up the educator to teach and give them back the time to follow up with student responses. This authenticity will keep those students enrolled again and again. It sends the message, my school cares about me. So we predict, we intervene, and we empower. So we've, um, we've done all these things and this is the most heartfelt part for me. As a farmer, former educator, the more data my leaders required, the less energy and time I had to focus on teaching. I can even remember being a first year teacher and having stacks of data dropped on my desk for me to analyze, and that pressure was overwhelming. After all, I had lectures to write, I had to practice, I had activities to plan and assignments to grade. And it wasn't until I was a seasoned educator that I even recognized the importance of having data on my students. But this pressure for educators to track and analyze on their own is one of the factors that leads to teacher burnout. And it's a real problem in 2022. We're leaving, leave, losing teachers at alarming rates. In Texas alone, in the past four months, 10 superintendents have quit in Dallas alone. A survey from the Texas chapter of the American Federation of Teachers released this February found that two thirds of teachers had considered quitting. This comes back to our responsibility. Let's empower those teachers, not add more to their plates. Right, Amy? Absolutely. Absolutely. And perhaps we got the slides all out of order because this is the most important. Yes. How do we empower those who are teaching the lifeblood of our education? How do we make that easier? We know you wear multiple hats and we know that data isn't why you fell in love with teaching. 
To highlight what we said earlier in the presentation, faculty also agreed that your presence was the most, if not the most critical aspects of online learning. Knowing that teachers are available, responsive, engaged in my learning, you care about me. What are ways that we can free up time for instructors? A needs grading dashboard, imagine a virtual to-do list of all the assignments left to grade in one place. No longer clicking through all of those courses. What about what is working? Where are my students spending their time? What activities are accidentally getting buried? Do I need to move them around? Do I need to revisit test that activity type? What, are, what do my students go back to over and over again? Imagine bringing multiple data together. Reduce those tabs, right? Reduce the data clutter. Let me clearly visualize what needs to be done. These shouldn't be questions or mysteries to our teachers. You should know, your teachers should know. You should have access to that in a point and click, quick, easy to understand format and make it pretty, please. I know we've likely experienced the never ending quick path to get to the data or the giant spreadsheet that's daunting. A platform can and should illuminate where you need to take action that is necessary. Show me the students that I need to contact. Save me time by organizing the tasks. Remind me when I need to reach back out. Show me where they're spending the time. Don't let me guess at my data. And so while we are a data company, our goal is to improve learning outcomes, to improve persistence and student success, and ultimately empower students to be more educated, skilled, and productive members of our global society. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. And thank you for being with us. We'd absolutely love to connect with you. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and look forward to hearing from you. Again, drop your email, drop any questions. We'd love to answer those for you.